Revelation chapter 15. Calling this last plagues prepared. Last plagues prepared. Revelation 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And, that, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now, here in Revelation chapter 15, what we don't find at the beginning of that uh, verse there, number one, is that saying, after these things, quite often we'll see as, as the Bible plays out, especially in this book of Revelation, uh, the chronology is given by that statement, and after these things, and after these things. And as I have found and, and tried to present, quite often with regard to chronology, heaven seems to be a little tricky in that area. There doesn't seem to always be a perfect chronology as to what we would expect to find in heaven as it plays out in earth. Heaven seems to be a little tricky when it comes to chronology. Uh, chapter 12, 14 and 15 seem to be, to me, little snapshots of events in heaven before or even as they're about to be revealed in earth. Sometimes how God presents it in heaven doesn't automatically play out the same way you'd expect it on earth as far as the events or as far as the timing is concerned, in my opinion. Now, the first thing that you see there in verse 1 is that this sign, I saw another sign in heaven, this is great and marvelous, there are seven angels having the seven last plagues. And it says, For in them is filled up the wrath of God. Therefore, God's wrath is full. God's wrath is final. God's wrath is in completion with these seven last plagues. I believe the Bible is indicating that there. So, the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up, the wrath of God. They take these plagues, and that's the fullness of God's wrath. We found out later that those seven plagues are encompassed by seven golden vials there in verse 7 that are full of the wrath of God. It is enough. God has enough wrath to, to use there in those seven plagues to basically have a fullness or a finality to that wrath. Now, in a study of the wrath of God, you can go to Revelation chapter 6 just to try to put us into the time frame of what we're dealing with. In Revelation chapter 6, at the end of it, in verse 17, it says, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And now, given this is the kings of the earth, the great man, the rich man, the chief captains, the mighty man, every bond man, every free man, hiding themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the earth, screaming to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the Lamb. And so they knew that it was Jesus. They knew that it was the Lord coming. And they're begging that they would be spared from the wrath of the Lamb. Crying out for the great day of his wrath is come. Now we can either just dismiss that as men making that statement. And that's not really what the wrath of God is indicating there. But 
I believe these as often are and can be, are unbelieving, unsaved people being inspired by the Lord to say what is right and fitting at this time. And I believe, according to the Bible, that when that time comes, they will say that exact statement. The great day of His wrath is come. It is presently here. It has arrived. It is come. Now, you could then refer over to chapter 7, and what you find there, I believe, is the rapture of the church. There you find a great multitude, which no man can number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, and they're standing before the Lamb, there in verse 9, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand, crying out salvation, as it arrives, I believe. Salvation is come at that exact moment. More indication of that being the rapture and it being after the great tribulation comes from verse 14. When the angel says to him, these are they, talking to John, which came out of great tribulation. Now if they came out of something, they had to be in it. If I come out of this building, it's because I was in it at one time. They have come out of great tribulation, which you find in Matthew chapter 24, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are born-again, blood-bought believers that have come out of great tribulation that has come upon them, and the Bible reveals them to be of all nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples. And I don't need to convince you further, but I believe that when it's all, it means all. Therefore, we stand here today with many nations, with many tongues, with many kindreds, with many peoples that are no more. Right? There are languages that are ceasing and, and expiring at an alarming rate. There are languages that have ceased to be spoken. Right? People talk about old dead languages and vernaculars that have faded away. And yet here all of those are standing before God. And so I believe that these are believers throughout all history simply being caught up together to be with the Lord. And so shall they ever be with the Lord at this time. And many of them then have come out of great tribulation. The shock being on John's face when he sees suddenly it's an empty room and suddenly a great multitude, innumerable, stands before him. The shock and surprise brings him just, just and, 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 that, and that coincides with in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at a last trump, that, that rapture event taking place. Now, as you follow after that, the rapture, following after the tribulation, you find in chapter 1, or in verse 1 of chapter 8, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So we have a seventh seal that is opened, at which time you'll have seven angels with seven trumpets. And these are seen in heaven, and they're about to blow their trumpets. And what happens afterwards is, I believe, the wrath of God. Because remember in chapter 6 they say it is come, and then there's this little bit of a, a segue or an aside where suddenly there's a great multitude in heaven, and we see the Lamb standing in the midst of His throne and with His people, and immediately after that it's opened, being that seventh seal in heaven, and then there's these angels ready to blow the trumpets. And when they do, these supernatural events start taking place on the earth. Things that you couldn't just have men do. Men couldn't just create, for example, hail and fire mingled with blood falling to the earth. They couldn't create great mountains cast into the sea. They can't create a great star from heaven coming down. You can't create the sun and moon being dark and all of these things and all of these woes and all of these calamities that come, I believe are none other than the handiwork of God miraculous events where he pours out his wrath upon earth. Now, Christians then are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why you find chapter 7 there. Great multitude of all kindreds, all people tongue, crying salvation. And that's what we're appointed to. Whether you die before that, during that, whatsoever time you pass away, blessed are the dead which die from henceforth, it said in a, a couple chapters previous of what we've studied. Whatever the timing, you're not appointed to wrath. Therefore, in this window of time, you're not going to have believers. They'll be appointed unto salvation. Then you get a few chapters later in chapter 11, after you've seen these trumpets sounding, these plagues and woes coming down upon mankind, where men are repenting not of the works of their hands, continuing to worship devils and idols of gold, uh, continuing in murders and sorceries and fornications and in all of their thefts. And all that takes place. And finally, 
in, in uh, Revelation chapter 11, in verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded. There's that last angel sounding. And there was a great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And so there the kingdom is established by the statement of the angels, the voices in heaven crying out that the kingdoms of the world are now become presently the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And that gives you the finality of things. Down in chapter 19, the temple of the Lord God is opened in heaven, and there is seen the temple of the ark of his testament. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. The temple coming out and, and these great calamities following after it at that seventh and final trumpet being sounded. Now, chapter 12 is a snapshot of history, I believe, of all the earth from a heavenly perspective. There you have the great woman in heaven, and I talked about all of this, being the birth of the man-child coming forth, and that's Jesus Christ being born. And then you have all of these events in history where Satan is trying to confound and destroy the man-child and his people and his work. Then you have in chapter 13, the mark of the beast is instituted by policy. The beast comes and gives his, his political policy to be that there would be craft, uh, craft prospering, and at the same time there would be a mark in the right hand or in the forehead that no man can buy or sell or take part in commerce if they don't have it. False prophet comes in and he gives credence or endorsement to that beast. Then in chapter 14, another snapshot from heaven, where in verse 10, wrath is promised, then in verse 16, the earth is reaped by the Son of Man on a cloud. There's the rapture again being indicated. And then in verse 17, down through 20 of chapter 14, you find the wrath of God again being poured out in the form of a wine press. So that, I believe, is a picture of what's going on in heaven when Jesus comes in verse 16 to reap the earth, and then also the angels come afterward or presently at that time to to put out the wrath of God, which is to draw all those wicked to stand them before God to go to the wine press of the wrath of God at that time. So, all of that brings us to chapter 15, which I believe is another sign in heaven indicated by the text. And it's, again, history repeating itself to a certain extent from a different angle, from more perspective. So you find there the seven angels having the seven last plagues in them is filled up the wrath of God. So that indicates that these are the final plagues. Now if we look back a few chapters, we already determined that there was a finality to the trumpet plagues indicated. And so I believe that these are kind of working together. They're synonymous. Seven last plagues. Unless we're to say that when God said the wrath is come, way back in chapter 6, it wasn't really come. It's just coming now, many chapters later. Either that or they're the same event happening from two different angles. I believe this is a picture from heaven and how it would be beheld in heaven. History repeating itself for clarity's sake. Now, there wasn't a lot of internal proof in the text to verse 16 of chapter 14. Being the rapture. It simply says, and he that sat on the cloud, being Christ, the Son of Man, from a few verses earlier, reaping the earth. Simply, he comes and the earth is reaped. He brings in the sickle, the earth was reaped. But if you look in chapter 15 and verse 2, it shows, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on a sea of glass, having the harps of God. And so these, that I believe were reaped in verse 16 of the previous chapter, are the ones that had gotten victory over the beast in the same event. How did he get over the victory over the beast? Well, it shows us in Matthew chapter 24 that except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be saved. And so the beast's reach was going to be to the, to the uttermost. He was going to destroy everybody except for the mercy of God. He shortened those days. When he shortened those days, he allowed for a small remnant to be spared from the beast. And what happens with that small remnant of believers that are spared from the beast, from taking the mark, from being destroyed, from not taking the mark, what so have you, is that the grace of God came and in a moment in a twinkling of eye, at the last trump, at that last moment, pulled them up and raptured them out of that earth, out of the, that time. So they were spared from it because of that. And here they stand, and what are they doing? They're upon a sea of glass 
that appears as it's mingled with fire. Now, you can go to Revelation chapter 21. Keep your finger where you're at. Revelation chapter 21. And in verse 18, the Bible says, And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And over in verse 21 it says, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, every several gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And so heaven, or the heavenly Jerusalem here, is indicated as being made of pure gold and also having streets of the city made of pure gold which resemble transparent glass and i've never seen it but i'm told that the yellowish hue that is on the golden jewelry that you wear or a golden uh, uh lump that you see the yellowish hue is actually impurities and that the more pure the gold it'll actually resemble a transparent nature and so it'll be transparent but as it were mingled with fire so there's that kind of oranges to it, but it's as glass. It's see-through because what we see and behold in gold still is only a certain percentage or a certain car carat amount or a certain quantity of gold within them. There's always impurities in what we see. And yet one day it records that if we are accounted worthy to get victory over the beast, that at that moment of chapter 15 and verse 2, believers will stand having gotten the victory of the beast and over his image on a sea of glass mingled with fire, which I believe is the pure gold of heaven. And they will have with them the harps of God. You're ready to play the harp. Does anyone know how to play the harp in here? <laughs> yeah, we got to be ready, right? Because he's just going to pass them to us and say, you know, let it rip. I don't know if there's going to be like a training session or we're all going to get instructions or maybe it'll just be one of these these knowledges that'll just be dropped in us the second we're giving our glorified body. We'll just we'll just know how to do it. We'll be astonished ourselves at our our playing abilities. Or maybe it's just one of those cases where the Lord loves a joyful noise and so he'll be happy even though we're all out of tune and just sound bad but no I think it'll be good I think it'll sound great but here at that time the hearts of God will be given to those with the victory as they stand upon streets of gold what a joyful day that will be and they'll be up there in heaven witnessing what I believe is about to take place from that perspective now what are they doing while they're there well the Bible says that they're standing on the sea of glass they've gotten victory and now they are about to play those harps. And what do they play? Verse 3. And they sing. Okay, so you've got to get your singing voices going too, right? There's going to be lots of singing and playing in heaven. So, so start practicing your instruments. Start practicing your singing. Every day we come here, there's a little piece of heaven, right? Because that's what we're going to be doing up there. Assembling and singing and praising the Lord. Eternity of that. Amen. What a glorious day that will be. But they're preparing, it says, to sing. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now, I think these are two different songs. The first being the song of Moses, the second being, and the song of the Lamb. They're going to sing these two songs. The second being the song of the Lamb, let's focus in on that, is what's recorded in text here. Mm -hmm. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. That'll be a great song. And with a tune to it and with harps playing, it'll sound wonderful. We'll all be in harmony, you know, because we'll all be expert singers by then. And it'll just, it'll just sound great and wondrous. You know, when you get in a choir anyways... The, the, the poor voices tend to get drowned out. And it all sounds good for some reason. I don't know why that is. That God allows for all of these voices of this tune and that tune and this timbre and that tone all come together and sound beautiful when they're in a congregation, even though half of us can't sing. That's because that's the intent of singing, is that there will be a great multitude all together, all singing, and all doing it to the glory of God. It's going to sound wonderful. It's going to be great in that day. And here, the song of the Lamb comes out, and it's a song, and the content is, is, is like the oldest thing in the book. The content is of rejoicing in the great works of God. 
And that was what Adam first did in Eden, just rejoicing in the great works, naming the great works of God, and having that opportunity to walk with Him, rejoicing in His great works, saying, Who shall not fear and glorify Thee, for Thou only art holy? Of course the Lord is the only holy one. He is the only perfect and righteous and upright and just one. Who shall not fear and glorify Thee? Their answer is, Nobody at that day. All nations coming. And in the, in the last day, finally, when his judgment has arrived, like it says there at the end of that song, his judgments are made manifest. When God judges, everybody's going to know. Everybody's going to come. Everybody's going to worship. And everybody is going to properly give God his glorious and glorified place as he deserves. And he's been wanting for us to give to him. God doesn't ask a lot, but to get the glory for everything. He deserves it, doesn't he? And so that song of the Lamb is one of rejoicing in the works of God, His holiness, the fact that all nations will eventually come to Him and sing the same. Why? Because His judgments are made manifest at this time. The other song it says there is the song of Moses, the servant of the Lamb. We go to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. There are two songs of Moses that I found. Exodus chapter 15. And there is one prayer of Moses in the song. But since the Bible here says they're singing the song of Moses, I figured I would leave alone the prayer of Moses and maybe study that another time. But go to Exodus chapter 15, where the Bible says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying. Verse 1 says, Then sang, or sorry, spake, saying, The Lord is my strength. Okay, it starts with, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And here the triumph is, the triumphant God is introduced in this song of Moses. He's typified here as having a great zeal for war. And always the righteous kind. As the man of war, if he's going to war against you, you deserve it. And he's ready to go to war against you. For the sake of his holy name, the Lord is his name. The Lord is a man of war and will triumph gloriously and will cast all horses and riders and the men that trust in the arm of them into the sea. He is my strength. He is my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will prepare him an habitation and his habitation I believe is in my heart and in my heart he ought to be exalted. This song continues down in verse 6, and it says, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. Strength here is given unto God, though he need not be given it. He just simply enforces it in order that he could dash his enemy. His greatness is what consumes those that rise up against him. Verse 9 says, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. They sound just like their father the devil saying, I will, I will, I will, I will be like the Most High. It's completely self-satisfying, this carnal, lustful mentality that the enemy has. But then verse 10 Thou didst blow with thy wind. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty water. Simply the breath of the Lord puts all of that I will, I will, I am boldness and pride to the bottom of the sea. The mighty waters take over him. Verse 13, it says, Thou in mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Mercy always goes out to His. He leads them. He redeems them. God is always in the business of caring for His people as they go through fear, as they go through dread. 
And that same fear and dread that men start to feel when they trust in God, he just turns it around on his enemies. Look at verse 16. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm they shall be as still as a stone. Till thy people pass over, O Lord. Till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Verse 18. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. And what a great song this is to sing of God's righteous judgments in that last day when we can rejoice. And I believe this could be very well the song that we sing. But this song of Moses is also of the children of Israel. And in the context, he's talking about specifically the dealings with the Egyptians. By type, we know that the Egyptian symbolizes the world at large. That is an affront to God. That is rebellious against God and wants particularly to hurt God's people. To keep God's people from performing the will of the Lord. To trap and to, and to molest God's people and force them into servitude and into, and into focusing on things other than that of God. Even when Egypt gives provision that the Lord's people can go and assemble together, Pharaoh would say things like, you can go and assemble, but not all of you can go. You can go and assemble, but you can't bring all of the furnishings and the children. You can go to assemble, but there's always some sort of compromise that the world expects from God's people when they go about to do God's business and to do God's work. But God's service comes without compromise. And so when he finally let them go, the Lord showed his outstretched arm and his might by his right hand as he swallowed up the enemies of God and swallowed up the world that would try to push them down. The next song of Moses you'll find there is in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And we were in Deuteronomy chapter 31, and that's why this one's interesting. It might even be a better case for this one being the song that we sing. Because we were there and we were talking about earlier rebellion. How the stiff-necked people um, would turn against Moses. And he makes this statement, I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And the evil will befall you, he says, in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord. So this is a song geared at latter days Israel. Latter days what would be God's people. They will corrupt themselves. They will turn from the way, the truth, the life which is Jesus Christ. They will turn in the sight of God and do evil, last days Israel is promised to do here in Deuteronomy chapter 31. And Moses prepares this song, and in 31 and verse 30 it says, And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. And I believe these are words that are set to be sung in the last days. And there are another word, another song that comes out, as judgment upon people that have turned their backs. Now this isn't the world, unfortunately. This, this, isn't, this isn't Egypt as the first song of Moses was intended as, as, a, as, a, as a blast at the Egyptians and their wickedness and how they were trying to put down God's people as they tried to flee. But rather, this song is one that is specifically aimed at God's people who rejected him who were rebellious against his ways and against his statutes. And as the Bible reports here, in the latter days, you will utterly corrupt yourself. You will turn aside from the way. And so here's the song I'd like to prepare and sing for you. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 1. It says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. The proper introduction given to God and His greatness as it's magnified. His work is perfect. His ways are judgment, or they're just, they're righteous. He's a God of truth, without iniquity, just and right is He all day, every day, forever. Is the promise made as, as they give that forth in song, as Moses gives that forth in song. But then he says this in verse 5. He says, they have corrupted themselves. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are perverse and crooked generation. What is he contrasting here? 
the spots of the godly versus the spots of the perverse and crooked, corrupt generation. And in the latter days, are we not going to see a spot or a mark that indicates a, a difference? There's going to be the perverse and crooked, corrupt generation that receives a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And then there's going to be the spotless children of God as they stand in heaven, clean and white linen given unto them. Their spot is not as our spot. Their mark is not as our mark. Every man will have the name of his father written in their foreheads, and they will have the name and number of the beast written in theirs. They have corrupted themselves. They're perverse and a crooked generation. It's sung here so long ago in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And I believe this will be rehearsed and sung in heaven while standing on glass-like golden streets. Judgment falls on them. And why does judgment fall on these people being mentioned? These corrupt, crooked, and perverse. Look at verse 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat. Jeshurun being a, 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 a name for Jerusalem, for the city of, of God, for where, you know, Jeshurun being essentially what's over there in modern day, um, what they call Israel, Jerusalem. Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat and art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. And how true is it that God's people, who would be God's people over there in God's land, have waxed fat, are proud, grown thick, fat with fatness, forsaking God, lightly esteeming the rock of his salvation. If they can bear it, most of them spit when his name is mentioned. Verse 16, they provoke him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. And this is what we're going to find in the last days, is an onslaught of new gods. The New Age movement preaches that we are all gods. Many religions preach that, that essentially God is within us. Hinduism, Buddhism. We'll find God by discovering ourselves. Most atheists have the mindset that I'm my own final authority. Whatever I see, hear, taste, that's what's real. Therefore, they are their final authority in all matters. Therefore, they've made themselves God. And you see how, how new gods, which newly came up and are, will be newly springing up in these last days, it's very clear. Like I've, like I've said, where I, I think that there will be that, that blending of the spiritual world with the carnal. And so when you have devils manipulating and roaming and working about, it will be so easy by these lame miracles that come to pass. Where people will either attribute a God and say, yeah, this is the God. Here is Christ. Lo, there is Christ. Right? They'll cry in the last days. Or they'll just make themselves Christ. By and large, we'll see a lot of that. And then people will follow after them. New gods springing up all the time. Now remember, of Jeshurun, or of Jerusalem, the Bible recorded in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8, that this was spiritually Sodom and spiritually Egypt. So it's not a righteous place. It's, it's a wicked place. It's likened unto the Sodom that God destroyed for the filthiness and violence that was in it. It's likened unto Egypt, which, which perverted the right ways of God and pressed down and oppressed God's people. And so Jeshurun at the end days will be no different. Provoking God with strange gods. Going after abomination. Sacrifice unto devils. Verse 18. Of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten the God that formed thee. What is the result of that? Verse 19. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. It's not that he abhors their sins, their doings, their ways, their God. He abhorred them, the people. Because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Because the last days people in wickedness will provoke God's people and hurt and harm God's people and will act in the way that they're charged and, and, and prophesied to, going after other gods and, and seeking after things that are ungodly, lightly esteeming the Lord that made them. Because of how they're acting, he will abhor them personally. 
Verse 20 says, And he said, I will hide my face from them. Nothing more fearful than God hiding his face from them. I think his wrath might be actually less fearful because if his wrath comes upon somebody, they can actually have a chance to repent. But if God's not even looking at them, hiding his face from them, it says, I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation. Children is in whom there is no faith. And there's the first mention of faith in the whole Bible. And it's regarding Israel. It's regarding God's chosen people. They are a people that in the latter days will be one of no faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We're saved by grace through faith. If you're not saved by faith, you're not saved at all. And so these people in the last days have no faith in order to give to their God. Lightly esteeming, be unmindful of the rock that bore them. The rock that offered them salvation. It continues on and says, They have moved me to jealousy, in verse 21, with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. It's just empty what they are provoking him with. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. And shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger, devoured with burning heat, and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them, with the poison of serpents of the dust. This is a song. I believe there's a song we'll be singing at the last day. And it will be a song of righteousness and rejoicing to those that are on the opposite side of what's being described here. But it's clear that God's had enough. It's clear that God is finished with this nation, turning his face from them that has provoked him to jealousy all this time, to the end that God has a lowest of hell reserved for them. Fire from the foundations of the mountains. Mischiefs come upon them so that they fall into their own traps. Spending his arrows. Verse 28 it says, For they are a nation void of counsel. There neither is there any understanding of them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding and of wisdom. Counsel comes by way of the multitude of counselors. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You have Moses. You have, you have uh, all of the prophets recorded in here. Isaiah, you can get counsel from. Jeremiah, you can get counsel from. Moses, you can get counsel from. You can go and get counsel from the books of Joshua, from the scribes that pen penned the Chronicles, and 1 Samuel, and, and all of those books. You can, get uh, you can get wisdom and understanding from Nehemiah, from Joel, Amos. You can get wise counsel and understanding from all these, and yet this nation is void of it. They want nothing to do with this council. They have no faith to believe it. They're a very forward generation. And this last day's generation will be seen and manifest clearly in our sight. Behold, in the latter days, he said, you'll corrupt yourselves. You'll turn aside from the way. Evil will befall you in the latter days. God's not slack in concerning his promise of this coming to fulfillment. Verse 29. Oh, that they were wise. That they understood this that they would consider their latter end. And you know what? Us that understand what we're reading here, we should consider their latter end. We should be mindful of what God is saying to people that were His people and yet rejected Him. We should be mindful of the truths that God's laying out. We don't need to turn aside. We don't need to corrupt our ways. We don't need to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking Him to anger. Lest we suffer on earth... The same consequences that he is giving these on earth as the song of Moses comes out. And as people, God's people are raptured out of this earth, which we will be, but through our lives we can suffer certainly these same things, right? It, it's, it's something that we can take and we can learn from and we can understand. This is why we're singing it. This is why it's going to seem so true. It's going to ring true in our hearts as we, as we proclaim these words. I'm wondering what the tune is going to be through, through such a song. But it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, though it seems dark and dim and, 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 and leery and, and, and just, just harsh, we're singing it. It'll all make sense when we finally sing it. The other side. Verse 35, it says, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. 
Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people, and repent himself for his servants, when he seeth that their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left. He shall say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted? And they shall eat the fat of their sacrifices and drink the wine of their offerings. Let them rise up to help you and be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he. And there is no God with me. I kill and make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of mine hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and bend mine hand, take hold on judgment, and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenge is upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. What God's promising here is he's going to set things right. He is going to put things in the proper order. He kills and makes alive. He wounds and he heals. He delivers. And there's none that can deliver out of his hand. He says, I lift up my hand and say I live forever. Anybody else want to? Right? He says, if I wet my glittering sword, my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, my sword shall devour flesh. God here is promising vengeance on those that turn aside. Vengeance on those that know God, right? His people, right? No God will glorify him not as God. This is going to be the, the, the manifestation of his righteous judgment in the last days. And this is one of the things that struck me when I was reading Revelation chapter 19, oh, so many years ago, when I beheld the scriptures and saw the Lord as the word of God, the Lord as the king of kings, the Lord as faithful and true, coming in the clouds and all men rejecting him, knowing it's Christ. When I read that, I'm like, I'm standing on the wrong side of this judgment. And I knew enough of the gospel to get saved, and that's to save me. When I did, it was all because of this revelation right here. That in the last days, there will be men that know God. And he's calling them his people. But they glorify him not as God. They're not thankful. They're given over to the reprobate mind, and so God turns his face from them as they turn their faces from him. And then comes his righteous judgment. The wet, glittering sword covered in blood. Arrows drunk with the blood of the same. He says, my sword shall devour flesh. God says he will set things right. Rejoice, O nations, with his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. No one else at that time. No one else will taste of the mercy of God. No one else will feel God's presence and his eyes upon them. Sometimes we get fearful that God's eyes are upon us, watching us. And we tell our kids, hey, hey the Lord's watching you. God sees that attitude. God is, is paying attention, right? He knows the thoughts and intents of your hearts when we, when we get a little bit scared of that. But nothing is more of a blessing than having the eyes of God upon you because when he turns, you're in trouble. That's really when you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. That's when judgment falls. So these songs then of glory to God, you can go back to Revelation chapter 15, and mercy to his people, and judgment to forsakers, traitors, and faithless. It's fitting that we would sing these in those last days. And follow it up with the statement, Thy judgments are made manifest. They're plain, they're clear. It all makes sense. We can see them as they're happening. And we know that you are righteous. All the scriptures suddenly make perfect sense to us. It's all manifest in our eyes plainly. That God will judge the forsakers and the traitors and the heady and the high-minded and the wicked and the proud, faithless generation. But he will extend his mercy to his people. And his mercy will be the thing that sustains us as we're standing in heaven, singing and rejoicing in the same. Revelation chapter 15, verse 5, it says, And after that, 
after that great song, that procession in heaven, where we arrive saved from the mark of the beast, singing with harps in our hands unto God, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, that great heavenly choir rejoices what's about to happen as they are saved from it. And after this I looked to behold the temple of the tabernacle of his testimony, of the testimony in heaven, was open. And that's the same thing you catch right at the end of chapter 11. In verse 19 where it says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings. It says the ark of his testament was seen in the temple as the temple of God was opened in heaven. And after that I looked, verse 5, And behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. These events coincide. And what happens after this? It says, And, verse 6 of chapter 15, after this, after we find that there is the rapture of the church, after we find that there is those that got victory over the beast, wrath comes. Same thing that plays out in chapter 11, back there. Verse 6, And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. These seven plagues are the seven last plagues, verse 1 tells us. Now, what we saw previous was seven angels with seven trumpets. We find here seven angels with seven vials. Both are full of wrath. Both are at the time of wrath. Both are immediately following a catching away event where God's people are pulled from it. And so these coincide. Seven angels, seven last plagues. Same thing we saw back there in chapter 6. We find preparing into verse 7 and 8, seven angels with seven trumpets. Just a different perspective, I believe, of the same events. All, all are full of wrath at this time, ready to be outpoured. Verse 7 says, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. He takes the living wrath of God, that eternal wrath of God, and it's contained in these last vials. And they're full and they're prepared, and they're set in place and ordered and given unto these angels for them to use at this time. The last plagues where the wrath of God is about to be poured out as God's people are safe and singing and rejoicing. And what's to come? Verse 8. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. You know what that's telling me? is that until God's wrath comes, we don't have access, full access, to the temple of God. Which means God's wrath has to come, as promised, before we have full access. Okay, the temple was filled with smoke, now here it is, from the glory of God and from His power. Because He's there, because of His great power, the temple is filled with smoke. Not only that, but the presence of God at this moment is such that no man is able to enter until the plagues of the seven angels are fulfilled. So until the wrath put into vials is poured out, the power of God's wrath is such that even His own people can't enter into His presence. The glory of God and His power is so much that is withstanding even His people. His wrath needs to be appeased. And in our lives, His wrath needed to be appeased, didn't it? When Christ entered in and took it upon Himself. When He turned His face away from His Christ child while He was sitting on that cross, hanging on that cross, preparing to die the death that we deserve. After living the sinless life that we could, God's wrath fell upon Him. But until Christ did that, taking the wrath of God upon Him for our sins, we had no access to the temple. We had no opportunity to come into the presence of the Lord, even as is pictured here. Why? Because His wrath was there. You don't want to enter into His wrath. You'll be destroyed by it. So here, the temple filled with smoke, ready to have that lifted, ready to have that absolved, ready to have that soothed, ready to have God finally come down and allow for us to have fellowship with Him and closeness with Him. It comes because He has to release His wrath. Just as much as the love of God is needful and desired, the love, the wrath of God is needful and ought to be desired by us. This is the thing, is that in the last days, we may not like it reading about God's wrath falling upon our 
loved ones, our neighbors, our co-workers, all the people that come to mind that simply will not believe. We want them to have the love of God, and this is why we go and we compel and we present to man the simple plan of salvation. You must believe and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. We say you need the love of God because you are standing in the place of His wrath. And until His wrath is resolved, and He has given recompense unto those that have rejected Him, until that happens, I can't even have my heaven. I can't even enter into his temple. I will go and I will sing praises unto him, but I will be waiting at that time for his wrath to fall, to have the fullness of joy that is set before me. And so we're going to have this bittersweet time where we're singing and rejoicing, but what are we singing about? Look at the song of Moses. Judgment upon, upon people that have rejected him. It doesn't seem like a great topic until you understand that that topic of the wrath of God must come to pass in order for us to have the fullness of joy that's promised us in heaven. And this is what is transitioning. We're getting to the point now where God has raptured out His people, and now His people are singing of His wrath, welcoming it, rejoicing that it's going to fall, and things are going to be set right on this earth. Once that happens, then we'll have access. And so as we turn the page, we expect what happens. First angel, second angel, third angel of God's wrath starts pouring out. And we're singing. Rejoicing in heaven over. I'm thankful, God, 